Hello and welcome to the first and only, I didn't check, open source full size claw machine. Full size means 68 inches tall, 36 inches deep, and about 31 inches wide. One fundamental feature about this claw machine is its construction. Its design mimics CNC machines rather than traditional claw machines, and that's done for two reasons. Flexibility in the design and availability or accessibility of parts. So in this video, I'm going to break down the design, construction, and build features of the machine, as well as a brief overview of the resource files that are available. You can build this yourself. Everything from CAD to code is open source. This machine runs on an Arduino Mega, a few stepper motors, and about 300 hours of work. I want to apologize to the world for a mix of metric and imperial hardware. It's just what was available. And a very special thanks goes to the individuals who helped me build this machine. A huge shout out goes to Joanne Chaway, Brian Lee, Lupe Carlos, Justin Harvilla, Jen Hitchcock, and an honorable mention to Nicole Sagali. But first, how did we get here? Claw machines are neat, but expensive. So can we build one for less? Well, yeah, but that excludes labor. I've taken a stab at claw machines before, but at one fourth the scale. This version is also open source if you're interested. But a bigger machine is more fun, so let's build a one to one scale claw machine. By the way, this machine is set on free play and lives on a college campus. As much as I love to give away hundreds of dollars of prizes, I'm stocking it with ramen noodles to keep things economical. So now to level with expectations. The cost of building this machine is around $1,200, which is based on this very loose bill of materials. The core parts are mentioned here, which are control and drive electronics, arcade joystick and buttons, motors, wood, acrylic, paint, and various motion components like idler wheels and pulleys. None of the listed parts in this bill of materials are critical. Feel free to substitute what you think works. Not individually called out in the bill of materials are hundreds of screws, nuts, and bolts. Much of that was a product of what was available and is a nightmare mix of metric and imperial hardware, so I'm not going to list it. Needless to say, this machine's cost will fluctuate based on how you source parts or remix the design. Something to come to terms with first is where most of the expense derives from. About five full sheets of furniture grade 3 quarter inch plywood. Lots of the core motion parts were sourced frugally. That means parts from old copy machines, computers, e-waste, other abandoned electromechanical projects that I've been hoarding over the past year because building this was on my horizon. Here's my best estimate of what this project cost if you know where to look for scrap parts. It's definitely cheaper than buying a real claw machine, but the comparison ends there. You'll make up the cost in labor probably two times over. By the way, this machine is not meant for profit or revenue generation. It could, but that's not part of the design goal. It's simply not secure enough nor reliable enough. There are large open gaps on the machine, pinch points everywhere, questionable wiring, and no coin slot. Even with all these minor flaws, the machine is still fun to play. And its construction was for the fun of it. Let's talk about the extra features programmed into the claw machine, as well as go into some mechanical details of its construction. There are two programmed game modes, which can be toggled between using this switch. Traditional, which is moving the joystick to aim the claw, then pressing the button to drop the claw and hopefully grab whatever's in the way. The second is full control. For about 60 seconds, you have full XYZ control of the claw with full grip power. The claw source code does not have any randomizers that hide the claw's grip strength. The reason for that is prizes are low value and this machine is not for revenue generation either. It's just for fun and to showcase how to tackle some basic mechatronic fundamentals. The code is open source, so one could add a coin slot function and a grip strength randomizer if your intentions were to recover the cost of prizes and maybe generate revenue. The body is as simple as possible. The body will require at least four full size sheets of plywood to construct. These four sides fit together with tabs and wood screws, and therefore a eight foot by four foot minimum bed CNC is recommended to fabricate the body. Every cut off and cut out was saved to build as much as possible. 
That includes the inside dividers for like the prize chute. You might want to invest in a fifth sheet of plywood if you want the prize floor and the machine interior bottom floor to be a single piece. Included in the open source files are the CAM toolpaths. Please note these are not current. The SOLIDWORKS files were revised to fix some things after the machine was built, and said CAM is also for a CNC that has an eight slot tool changer. Likely your tools aren't gonna match. However, the toolpaths are included for reference. You can view them with vCarve, but you'll likely need to create your own from the current SOLIDWORKS files on your CAM software and CNC of choice. The CAM does give you a good idea what cutting and drilling operations are required to support this design. The support ledges that hold up the shelves of the machine are glued using dowels. There are a number of drill holes on each sheet. The windows are recessed, so a pocketing operation is recommended for at least three sides. For efficiency, a few tool changes are recommended. Total cutting time on this machine is about two hours spread across four sheets of plywood, not counting setup time. So part of designing and building is overcoming hurdles that just happen. Referenced in the CAD model, the rear of the body is shown as a window. And this was the original intent until I failed to periodically check the collet tightness and then the tool drop made cut. This ruined the pocket inset for the rear window on the rear panel. And to avoid scrapping nearly an $80 sheet of plywood, the recovery was to change this tool path to a full cutout. And this really worked out in the end because this is now the access panel or service panel for filling prizes and usually untangling the claw every now and again. I'm using butterfly latches as the hardware to make this access easy to open and secure. The core mechanics of the machine were sourced frugally. The NEMA 23 stepper motors are from an industrial cockman machine that was scrapped for e-waste. These are bipolar stepper motors. Two of these NEMA 23 motors, which are mirrored in drive, move the y-axis. One motor moves the x-axis and the fourth motor pulls the claw up and down in the z-axis with a custom pulley. Stepper motors are versatile in CNC machine builds. We need high torque, low speed, and a simple way to mount the motor to the gantry. Stepper motors like this make things simple mechanically, but will require some finesse electrically to drive them. A hobby grade servo motor opens and closes the claw. The claw here is cheaper than buying the actual solenoid driven claw, plus the analog position of the claw gives an added level of strategy to the game. The main motion mechanics or gantry of this machine rests on an aluminum extrusion frame. This frame provides a uniform and flat surface for the idler wheels to roll on. This frame sits on a support ledge around the inside perimeter at the machine's top. This way you can remove the gantry or build it separately and drop it in place when it's ready. GT2 timing belts move the X and Y axes. Various timing pulleys and idler wheels sort out the belt paths and rolling motions. These parts are really common in 3D printer and desktop CNC builds, so sourcing them should be pretty straightforward. They are mainly M4 and M5 parts bolted to custom plates. These are mostly symmetrical plates, which were cut on a smaller water jet using quarter inch 6061 aluminum sheets. During the design and testing phase, prototypes were laser cut from plywood, which I suspect will hold up for the most part if you don't have access or don't want to pay for water jet parts. A few custom 3D printed mounts were designed to hold the timing belts and the limit switches. The limit switches are needed here to prevent the machine from driving past its physical boundaries. These are also necessary to let the machine home to the XYZ zero position and drop a prize when the time limit is reached. The claw is a scaled up version of a servo claw I made a few years ago. It's made from laser cut parts. This design is serviceable and has okay grip strength, but I could see this changing in the future. For now, I'll let the community build a better one. The user inputs are just generic arcade components. A joystick and buttons provide all the user inputs. Located below the control panel is an operator panel that can switch game mode, reset the Arduino, or shut off power if there is some kind of problem. I do not recommend you cheap out and buy any e-stop on Amazon. This e-stop no longer breaks the circuit and because it's very cheap is definitely not reliable in the case of an emergency. For now, you have to switch off power on the rear panel. The windows are 1 8 inch thick clear acrylic. Acrylic is way easier to cut than glass, 
The downside is it scratches easily and attracts dust because it holds a static charge. Aluminum binding posts are the specialty hardware that attach the windows to the body. I don't recommend drilling this many holes, it's just a lot of hardware. Let's get into more electromechanical details of the machine. Bigger motors moving bigger loads need bigger drivers. So these stepper motor drivers are pretty common online, but I do recommend you seek a controller that has a genuine Toshiba TB6600IC. This is a bipolar micro-stepping motor driver that gives a number of quality of life features that greatly simplifies controlling lots of stepper motors, along with their bigger current driving requirements for like NEMA 23 motors. The ones I'm using here are definitely knockoffs, but they still haven't failed yet. The brains that control and drive everything in this machine is an Arduino Mega. But what I consider a very critical component on top of this is a screw terminal breakout shield. All 70 pins are broken out to screw terminals, making wiring connections way more robust than any other method to land this amount of connections. This screw terminal shield is typically sold as a kit that you have to solder. And speaking of easier wiring, I also recommend a few barrier strips. This will give you way more junction points for the excessive amount of ground, 12 volt, and 5 volt connections required to build this machine. And speaking of power, an ATX PC power supply provides all the needed power for everything this machine could consume but lots of cabling is needed for something this size. So for cost savings, I use Cat5 and Cat6 cables. To make things somewhat modular, I made this RJ45 breakout PCB. It just makes things easy to connect and disconnect when you're in a build process that takes months. Ethernet cables provide the long cabling to route the user controls and the stepper motors. This PCB also allows the CAT5 or CAT6 pairs to be tied together to essentially double the current capacity of the wires since we're using these to power the stepper motors. Everything wired will look like this on the first run and knowing this is going to go on YouTube, this is my second pass to clean things up. Again, there is an electrical diagram, and I strongly recommend you reference this if you are attempting to build this machine, along with the provided code. I highly recommend you add a service light inside the interior. This is just an Edison socket with a junction box. Now let's look at some code and just some general best practices for motors and machines like this. There are two versions of code available, an unfinished version that I stopped writing, which is bundled in the CAD package, and the current version coded by a computer science major, Lupe, that squeezes quite a bit of optimization out of the Arduino. This version can be found in the GitHub link provided. Included with the source code is a pinout chart along with a full electrical wiring diagram. Reference both of these when connecting all the machine's internal wiring. I can't guarantee it's totally error-free, but the code is the best source to know what drives what. I want to emphasize two key points for any DIY claw machine. The expectation of this machine is to be powered on for days, maybe weeks. And during this idle time, it is critical the machine is not powering the motors to be at a hold or set torque position. Many Arduino stepper motor libraries have this function in by default, as it's a vital characteristic in CNC machines. To negate this, there are two methods exercised here, a hardware and software workaround essentially. A relay module cuts power to the servo motor when the machine is in idle. Without this, the servo motor gets pretty warm, supplying constant power to hold the last set position. This will just burn out the claw servo motor. For the stepper motors, they're also in an off state, but this is done in code. The stepper driver enable pin is pulled low on all four drivers when the machine goes into its idle or standby state. This cuts the holding power to all stepper motors, so the motors are at a rest state when the machine is not in use. If you don't do this, you're going to consume a lot of power, the stepper motors will never cool off, and eventually wear out prematurely. 
So after building something this size, there's always room for improvement, and this machine is not without its faults. The most difficult part of this machine are the hurdles you don't see until all the small subassemblies come together and are functioning as one big unit. And the biggest problem in this scale is cable management. An open top machine simplifies construction and allows the maximum range in motion in the X and Y axes. The downside to this is how do you route all the cables out of the way? There's really no place to hide them and they're big heavy cables. Stepper motors need twice the conductors as opposed to brushed DC motors on traditional claw machines. So cable carriers were necessary at this scale. And sadly, I haven't figured out an elegant solution to put a cable carrier on the x axis That means this rub point will eventually turn from an issue into a problem. Traditional claw machines also have a coiled elastic power cable connected to the claw, and that's for good reason. I'm pretending that not getting the claw tangled in its own power cord is part of the game strategy here. So yeah, this does need some kind of solution, which I don't have at this point. But overall, this machine is pretty reliable. Maybe once in 40 game cycles, the Z-limit switch fails to trigger because the claw is swinging around so much, it just misses the limit switch altogether. And I think adding a timeout in the code when retracting the claw and homing would kind of help negate this going into a state where it's stuck. But that's still on the list of to-do, and I recommend the community add that. This machine was a very fun and challenging project. I can't speak much for the color scheme. It's just the best that I could do with whatever leftover paint that was available. Remember, all the design files and code are open source. There is a SOLIDWORKS drawing packet that does illustrate scale and some of the whole patterns on critical motion components. But you should use the part files and extract vectors if you're going to CNC anything for this machine. There are also vector drawings for the gantry plates as those were drawn in Inkscape and designed for 2D fabrication. But overall, the SOLIDWORKS files, for the most part, are good to go. This project is challenging if you have the tools and difficult if you do not, but still achievable with lots of compromises. So happy building and thanks for watching.